All right, so we're up to key issue three of chapter 10, and we're going to go ahead and take a look at agricultural regions within MDCs. And our section's broken down into six types. We have mixed crop and livestock. We have dairy farming. We have grain farming. We have livestock ranching, Mediterranean agriculture, and the final one that we typically see only in MDCs is commercial gardening and fruit farming. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at each one of these and break them down. All right, mixed crop and livestock ranching is going to be the first uh, topic we're going to look at. And this is done where we're mixing crops with animals. But in this case, most of these crops are going to the animals. They're being fed to the animals. And we do this to uh, raise for beef cattle. Uh, we raise it uh, for, uh, we feed it to animals for milk and chickens for eggs. Now the advantage of this is that it gives farmers income all year. So that when there's no crops going on in the wintertime, there's still getting um, money from their animals, either through the milk or the eggs or processing them for beef. Much of the cattle feed that we see comes from corn. And the Corn Belt in America stretches from Ohio all the way over to the Dakotas. And this corn is used to feed animals. Most corn goes to animals. So when you see pictures of these corn fields out west, much of that's going to feed animals. Another important crop is soybeans. And while many of us might eat soybeans with uh, something, something like tofu, much of the soybeans are going to feed animals. One of the aspects of mixed crop is what's called crop rotation. Now crop rotation is not anything new. Crop rotation has been done since the 5th century AD. This is where a farmer will take his property, divide it in half, and will grow something on one field and leave the other field fallow, which means he's not going to grow anything on it. And that gives time for nutrients to get back into the soil in order for it to grow food. He then will rotate it over the following season, leaving the other field fallow and growing on the one that wasn't used the previous year. Now in the 8th century, they went to three fields, and in the 18th century, they went to four fields. And what they might do is leave one fallow in the four fields, they'll grow a root crop, uh, maybe something like wheat, and then that way the root crop is leaving nutrients behind so that when the wheat comes through, it'll have new nutrients and they continue moving these crops around in that aspect. And then that way it doesn't burn the nutrients out of the soil. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to dairy farming because I know if we didn't cover it right now, you'd find it to be an utter disappointment. And um, so speaking of dairy farming, um, it's very common in the Northeast United States, Southeast Canada, and Northwest Europe. And really dairy farming is more of an MDC thing. We very rarely see it in LDCs. And the main reason is, is because it takes a lot of grain and land to be able to feed these dairy animals. And if you're struggling to uh, find places for your people to live, or you don't have the right climate to be able to grow the grains to feed these uh, animals, it's going to be very difficult to focus in on dairy. Now while MDCs really focus in on dairy, three countries are really, really becoming massively involved in it, and that's India, China, and Pakistan. And what this also shows is that their income levels are increasing a lot and they don't have problems feeding their people or having the land to be able to use for these animals. An important term that goes along with this is something called the milk shed. The milk shed is the distance from a city to where the milk comes in from. It used to be only 30 miles because milk perishes very quickly. But because of refrigerated transport and other methods to preserve milk, we now see milk sheds 300 miles away. So what we're talking about is every city within Canada, North America, including the United States, and Europe, they are all within 300 miles of where their dairy is coming from. Uh, now, these films are being based out of Orlando, and what we can find is even in Orlando, our dairy is only coming from right down the road, basically, just the counties are too south of us. So within 45 minutes away, in about 30 to 40 miles, we're seeing where our milk is coming from. Now, dairy farming is very, very intensive. Dairy cows must be milked twice a day. If not, what basically happens is that their udders can start dragging against the ground and they become infected. And if your cows get infected, um, they could die and you're losing profit in that. 
Also a problem that comes with dairy farming is you've got to be able to feed these animals in the winter time. And that's where we see silos. So if you ever see barns in this tall cylinder next to it, that's a silo and that stores, stores grain. And then that way they're able to feed the cattle in the winter time when the snow's on the ground and they're unable to forge through um, grazing pastures to find food. Our next topic we're going to look at is grain farming. Grain, it comes from basically grasses. So when we're talking about wheat, oats, uh, barley, millet, they are all actually a type of grass. But they have a seed at the top that we're able to use for human consumption. And these types of grasses are basically what we use for humans. Now the most important one is wheat. Wheat is used for bread flour and obviously bread is a very common meal for many, many people. The United States and Canada make up about 50% of the wheat exports in the world. So we are known as the world's bread basket because of the amount of wheat that we do produce and export to other countries who buy it from us, like China. Other countries that are very big in the grain farming, Argentina, France, Australia, and the United Kingdom. Now, in continuing to talk about grain farming, we're going to take a look at two types of wheat that are very common in America. The first is winter wheat. Winter wheat is actually planted in the autumn, and even though it will grow in places where it snows, when they plant it, it actually gets a root system into the ground. And in the spring, it begins to grow. This is typically done in Kansas, Colorado, and Oklahoma. And they, after it begins to grow in the spring, they are able to cut it down and reap it in the summer. Another type is called spring wheat, and this is grown in the Dakotas, Montana, and southern Canada. And what they do with spring wheat is they plant it in the spring and then it's ready by autumn. So it depends where you live what kind of wheat you would be growing. Now large scale production of wheat is done in America and Canada at very massive scales. And this is because of, in the 1830s, we get something, uh, the McCormick Reaper, and that allows the um, large scale production to begin. And then later on we get combines, and the same type of combines that we've seen in the past, uh, these combines can cut down just massive amounts at one time. But because of exp how expensive they are, a lot of regions share them. And um, they move them from city to city, or even a group of farmers will have to go in to buy them. Because they do run about $200,000. And that's why sometimes farmers will sublet out and pay somebody to come in and uh, reap, that, reap the fields for them. Alright, next category is livestock ranching. And livestock ranching is usually done in semi-arid areas. Now what we mean by this is that there's still grasses and weeds growing out there on the land, but it's not the perfect land for growing your typical produce that we would find uh, that we use in grocery stores. Livestock ranching really became in a demand in the 1860s here in America. And that's because that's when our cities really start to grow. And because you get a lot of people moving into cities, there's a more and more of a demand for beef. So cattle ranching becomes very, very common. Now, you may have learned in American history at some point something called the long haul. And what that meant was the cattle started in Texas, and the cattle were called longhorns, and that's how the University of Texas got its nickname, its mascot. And they would take this cattle, and when they got to a, a certain weather, climate, growth, they would start moving the cattle from Texas all the way up to Kansas to where the railroads were. And they would load them onto the railroads and move them into the city for slaughter. The problem is sedentary agriculture also starts moving in. And because of things like wheat and better irrigation uh, practices, they weren't able to do the long haul. They weren't able to move these cattle over that distance. So they began to bring the railroads into Texas so they could move the cattle out. Now, America is not the only one that does this, this type of livestock ranching with the cowboy, kind of the lure that came about uh, for Americans. We also see livestock ranching in Australia, the Pampas of Argentina, southern Brazil, and Uruguay. And these countries produce a lot of beef that is um, passed around the world, shipped out around the world. The next topic we're going to look at is Mediterranean agriculture. Mediterranean agriculture is typically grown in MDCs, 
because it is foods that aren't necessary for survival. Now the Mediterranean uh, agriculture get its name because of the Mediterranean region. You know, we're talking about Southern Europe, um, Western part of Asia that touches the Mediterranean Sea and parts of Northern Africa. And what you need is a very hot, dry summer and a win wet winter. And what we can also find in these areas is transhumans, which we've talked about before with um, the cattle herding or goat herding that moves around due to the seasons. Now, Mediterranean agriculture is for human consumption. It is growing uh, horticulture, which is fruits and vegetables and flowers that are just meant for humans. This isn't things being grown to feed cattle. Uh, much of what we talk about when we say Mediterranean agriculture are figs, olives, and grapes. So these are things that are typically associated with Mediterranean agriculture. Uh, in fact, the Mediterranean region is so well known for their grapes that two-thirds of all wine comes from that area. Now there are other places in the world that have Mediterranean climates. Northern California, Chile, New Zealand, and parts of Australia are also considered to have Mediterranean climates. These areas are also become very well known for their wines, so you could definitely see the connection with it. All right, our last topic we're going to look at is commercial gardening and fruit farming. And many of us may be familiar with this. Now, if you're in the southeast United States, this is very common in our areas. And we also see some of it up in the New England area. Uh, now, this originally comes from something called truck farming. And truck actually comes from Middle English. It comes from England uh, back in the old days. And it means the barter. So if you've been to a, a farmer's market, that is not a new idea or concept. Farmers markets are actually something from thousands of years ago. Now the difference is today we use cash, but in the old days you would barter or trade. So if you wanted tomatoes, you would offer maybe something you grow and return to it. So when we talk about truck farming, we're talking about barter farming and moving something around. Fruits and vegetables um, are always meant for consumption of humans in this case. So when we're talking about commercial gardening and fruit farming, think of the produce market at your grocery store that's what we're talking about. And all of that is meant for human consumption.